There's one more thing I want to do, um, which is I want to discuss currents a little bit. Let's just define what a current is. And the reason why we're going to discuss a current is because currents are what sets up magnetic fields. Now, in the same way that we had electrostatics, which meant electric fields that didn't depend on time, we now want to talk about magnetostatics. And that means we want to set up magnetic fields that don't depend on time. Since the current sets up the magnetic field, to get a magnetic field that does not depend on time, we need a steady current. Okay? So if you like some sort of a constant current. And so we'll need to say precisely what we mean when we talk about a steady current. And we'll define that now as well. Good. So Let's um, think about a piece of wire. So now I want to define a current. Okay. So here we have a piece of wire. And we imagine somewhere along the wire we've got some cross-sectional area A. There is some cross-sectional area A. What we're interested in studying is the amount of charge per unit time that passes that area A of the wire. Okay? So this is what we're actually going to study. What is the amount of charge passing A per unit time. So we want the rate at which charge passes A. And uh, we could imagine doing the following. What's going to be important is the speed with which those charge carriers are traveling. If those charge carriers are traveling, with some velocity v, then in a time v dt, all of the particles inside this cylinder will manage to get past that blue area. Why is that? Because the particles sitting here at the back of the cylinder, they just manage to travel the distance v dt. So they just get past the surface. So all of the particles inside that cylinder there, past that blue surface. Is everyone happy with that? So if we say how much charge passes that blue surface, you may be tempted to say A times by V <coughs> dt, that's the volume. Everything inside that volume passes, and then we might want to multiply by the charge density. But that's not quite right. And the reason why it's not quite right, let's imagine that this is the area, okay? If the particles are moving with the velocity v, but they're going parallel to the surface, then no charge passes the area. So the only component of the velocity that counts is the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the area, okay? So let's define a unit vector perpendicular to A that we will call n hat. So if that's A, imagine a unit vector n hat. And the component of the velocity that's relevant is n hat dot V. This amount of charge, dQ, will pass that area A per unit time. So we can now write this as follows. Um, dQ dt 
will be equal to A times by rho times by V dotted into N hat. Now, can anyone tell me what is A times by rho? Lambda. Lambda. Charge per unit length. Okay? Let's see why that's the case. Very good. Um, so imagine we take some piece of wire and we decide to cut some length of that piece of wire. And I say to you, how much charge is there in that piece of wire? Well, one thing you can tell me is it's the length of that piece of wire multiplied by the charge per unit length. Or you can tell me it is the volume of that piece of wire multiplied by the charge density. But the volume of that piece of wire is the length times by the area of that piece of wire times the charge density. And if you now compare that formula to that formula, drop the L's, you learn that lambda is equal to A times rho. So that's what we're using over there. So we can write this as lambda V dot N hat. And what we define for our current, I, I is equal to lambda V. So that's how we define our current. We can also define a current density. And the way a current density is defined is as follows. Um, imagine you have got some surface S and there's a current flowing through S. Okay? So this current is flowing at all points. The way the current density is defined is pick some small area. Uh, let's maybe make it blue. So this will be the area element dA. The amount of current flowing through dA, so the current through dA, this little area element, is equal to J dot dA. So we need to multiply by the area to get the amount of current. But you can see if we take this current over here and we divide by area, what do we get if we divide lambda by area? Charge density. So J is equal to the charge density times the velocity. So that is the volume current density, and this is the current. Both of those will play a role in what we do. So those are the sources that we'll use. There is one last thing that I want to do in this lecture, and that is that I want to talk about the conservation of charge. And let's see what the conservation of charge is. have some uh, closed surface S.
if we pick some little area element on this closed surface, dA. dA points outside, and the magnitude of dA is the area of that little element. If I calculate J dot dA, I will have the current flowing out of the sphere through that tiny area. So if I integrate J dot dA over S, this will be the total current flowing out of S. We know what that is. That is dQ dt. So if we call the charge inside the sphere, Q equals the charge inside S, then this is equal to dQ dt. Do you agree with that formula? If J dot dA is positive, which way is the current flowing? Out of the sphere. Everyone agree? So if J dot dA is positive, the current flows out of the sphere. If the current flows out of the sphere, is the charge inside the sphere increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. If the charge inside the sphere is decreasing, is dQ dt positive or negative? negative. But we just said this was positive. So in fact it's not dQ dt, it is minus dQ dt. Okay? And we also know how to express Q. Q, which is the charge inside the sphere, can also be written as the volume of the charge density d3r over the inside of S. This is equal to uh, over the inside. And this, so we've got an equation, which is good. It's, that's a good equation. We want to do one more thing. We want to use the divergence theorem to rewrite this side. Can you tell me what the side is if I rewrite it with the divergence theorem? The integral of? Divergence of? J. Good. The integral over the inside of the divergence of J, d R. Very good. And now notice that this is equal to that for any surface S. The only way that these two integrals can be equal if we integrate over any volume is if the integrands are equal. So that means, in fact, the divergence of J is equal to minus the rho dt or the rho dt plus the divergence of J is zero. The rho dt plus the divergence of J equal to naught. This is the statement of the conservation of charge. I'm going to come back to this conservation law when we do special relativity, and we'll talk a little bit about why the conservation law has to take this form. For now, I want to just comment that if all of your currents are steady, charge can't be collecting anywhere. Imagine there's a river flowing, and the river's flowing at some steady rate. 
So the same amount of river keep, the same amount of water keeps flowing down the river. What that means is the water's not collecting anyway. So there's no dams anyway. Okay? The water just keeps flowing at some constant rate. The amount of water at any point will be the same. Okay? The same thing here. If you have a steady current flowing, the amount of charge at any point will be exactly the same. What that means is the charge density doesn't change with time. So if we have a steady current, um, steady current, the charge is not collecting anywhere, it just keeps flowing. Okay? Because it's not collecting anywhere, the rho dt is zero. But if the rho dt is zero, it means the divergence of j is equal to naught. And that condition, that the divergence of j is equal to naught, this is the condition for magnetostatics. This is when we say we're dealing with magnetostatics, what do we mean? We're dealing with currents whose divergence is zero. When we say we're dealing with electrostatics, we're dealing with charges that are stationary. Magnetostatics means the divergence of the current density is zero. So this is what magnetostatics is. Good. Any questions on that, guys? Okay. So one last thing for this lecture. The joke. Do you guys want a joke? <laughs> okay. I've got a joke for you. Um, so this joke involves uh, uh, some people that are flying in a plane. And uh, you guys will have noticed that in the bigger plane, so not too big, but in the middle sometimes there are three seats. So three people can sit there together. So all of the passengers get on, three people sit there together, and these three guys start talking to each other. And after they talk a little bit, they realize one of them is a mathematician, <laughs> one of them is a physicist, and one of them is an engineer. Okay? So they're talking away, and the physicist and the mathematician are having a great discussion about some new piece of mathematics, some new physics, and the engineer is feeling a little bit left out, and he's also feeling like, wow, these guys know so much more maths. So much more than I do. And he thinks, man, maybe they're going to think I'm stupid. So the plane's flying, and the pilot comes on and he says, look, the winds look good. We're going to get there in eight hours. So they're driving along, and next thing they hear, <laughs> and the pilot comes on the intercom and he says, listen, guys, don't worry. One of the engines broke, but we've still got three more engines. It will be fine. The only problem is instead of taking eight hours, now it's going to take nine hours. So the mathematician, the physicist say, it used to be eight hours, now it's nine hours, why is that? And they explain it and they say, oh great, now we understand. And they say, if we lose one more engine, we know it will take 12 hours. So anyway, the plane's going along and the next engine breaks. The pilot comes on and says, look, we've just lost the second engine. But don't worry, we've still got two more engines. But now it's going to take 12 hours. And the physicists and the mathematicians are really happy that they managed to calculate it. And the engineer is not so happy because he doesn't know how to calculate it. So then they sit down and they think, if we lose one more engine, how long will it take? And so they sit down, they calculate and everything, and they see 16 hours. Then they're flying along, and sure enough, the third engine goes. The pilot comes on and he says, Look, guys, we've lost three engines. It's going to take us 16 hours, but don't worry. The aircraft is very safe. We've still got one engine left. And then the pilot switches off. And now the engineer, before the mathematician, the physicist can say anything, he wants to say something. And he says to them, you know, guys, if we lose that fourth engine, we'll be up here all night. <laughs> okay, guys, that's it. See you tomorrow.